All right. Um, in the next 30 minutes, Ramil, a uh, senior software engineer at Ergon, will uh, tell you how to stay sane in the ever-changing environment of the IT industry and how to follow up with all the changes. Take it away. Yes. Uh, so, sorry for the slight hiccup. Uh, I'm here to talk about hype. Now, before we get all hyped up, a few words about me. I'm a senior software engineer working at Ergon. I've worked over the years in various different projects, in different industries. I love learning, and uh, somebody once told me that an effective way of learning is to teach and to exchange knowledge. So that's one reason why I'm here. And I'm, like I said, working for Ergon, and I'm proud to be an Ergonian because I believe we do a lot of things right when it comes to software engineering. This is the company I work for. We're, this is our main office in close to Zurich Stadlhofen. It's already founded. It's actually my age, 84, good year. And uh, by now we have over 330 employees, most of them engineers, software engineers, uh, various apprentices, uh, various interns, actually a lot of ETH students uh, intern at our company. We're all located in Zurich, privately owned company. And I'm not the only one who likes to work there because we frequently win awards for a good place to work at. So we're all engineers, well, not all of us, but mostly engineers, and so we love to build software and build it from the get-go to the finish. Like I said, we're not only engineers, we also got an awesome marketing team, and I believe uh, lots of us, lots of you received this welcome box, because normally we would like to meet everybody in person. Sadly, this year this is not possible. So we're hoping that this welcome box, uh, yeah, takes some of that um, off. Yeah, so let's talk about software engineering. I mean, software engineering is, is great. It's awesome. You can rethink whole industries. It's groundbreaking, it works on a global scale. It's disruptive, endless possibilities. It's challenging, all great traits, and it's cool to be a software engineer because nowadays you can do anything without software. Software is everywhere. And it's true. We have, you have unparalleled possibilities. When I think about it, one person on a laptop can deploy software to hundreds of servers across the globe and build software used by millions, all while enjoying the view on a hilltop on a drinking some coffee, and just enjoying the view while you're online through your phone. It's amazing. So what are you all doing here? You should go, go out there, build awesome software. I mean, look at him. He's all, all psyched up, ready to go. So that maybe years later, you look back at your career, and you say, yeah, it's cool. Being a software developer, it's, it's not stressful at all. And look at Kyle here, he's satisfied, and 29? Oh no, <laughs> what happened? What happened to him? What made him all go, go all uh, Barack Obama? Maybe, maybe software engineering isn't quite stressful. So let's talk, about, talk to the other guys in the room, other developers. And this is actually quite funny, if you speak to senior developers, guys, who have been in the, guys and girls who have been in the business for quite a while, almost everybody has at least some point in the career contemplated about what to do when it all gets too much. Usually that's when you're knee deep in the debugger, trying to figure out why something is not working. That's when you think, geez, if I could just build Legos, it would be so much better. Or just ride, drive a bus, right? This, no IT, just... Go forward, easy. Why is that? Because it can't be the actual software programming. Because most of us, we love that. Even we have sites projects. We 
program in our spare time. I mean, open source is a thing. A lot of people just program for fun in their, in their time off while sitting at home, you still program. So it can't be the actual program. We really, we, we like that. So maybe it's because software engineering is, is hard. It's difficult. Why is it difficult? Something like that, it never happens, right? You never really exactly know what to do. It's always different. It's uh, almost by definition it's different, because if, it w if you'd build something you already know how, you would just copy the thing you already built. So it's always something new. You always have to figure out what to do, how to do it, and that can be stressful. Also, software is increasingly complex. I mean, the, build the solutions we build now are fully integrated, and users are spoiled by the features big players provide. And we've come to uh, expect that in whatever we use. I mean, Google, Facebook, all the big guys, they provide awesome software, and you expect that everything has to work as great as it does. The applications are more and more broad. You have web applications, you have mobile web applications, you have native apps, you have IoT uh, solutions, you have machine learning models, et cetera, et cetera. And oftentimes, we're automating messy human interactions. And humans, we're really good at being flexible. We can just make things up uh, along the way. And the software we build is really bad at that most of the time. It's I mean, you write it, and then it works the way it does. And when, when you get a, thrown a curveball, you have to adapt. And oftentimes, you didn't think of that. It's, so it's difficult. Also, engineering is hard to grasp. If you speak to someone who is not working in software engineering, it's very abstract, because the effort is invisible. One day, somebody flips a switch, and the application is just here. It's just, it's just there. You don't see how much work that it was. You don't know if it was just one person just working for a week, and it's there, or was it a theme of, team of 200 people working for two years? No way of knowing as opposed to, let's see, say somebody, a, a bridge is built. You can see that, what kind of work is involved. Like I said, features and products appear overnight, and almost anything is possible. It might be messy to build it, but it's almost anything is possible. And it's hard to explain that sometimes things are really easy to build, and sometimes others are really difficult, even though they seem similar from the outside. And that's often we build software for people who are not working in software, and for them it's hard to understand that. So let's look at this. Somebody's building the Eiffel Tower, and that's how things often go, right? You're building something and says, yeah, that's good, it's good, all oh, looking great, and almost, you're almost done. Somebody says, oh, well, the requirements changed. Uh, this is our new design, and uh, can you just, yeah, how are we doing on the deadline? Now, if you're lucky, you have a good project manager, and you have uh, the requirements set up, set up properly that you can just say, no, 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 we're not going to do this. So let's imagine the Eiffel Tower is a software project. So you have the Eiffel Tower, it's built, it's great, it does what it should, and then one day somebody says, oh, well, we should, we should, People are always asking what time it is, so maybe we should just put a clock on there and just... So, yeah, you can do this. You can just take your piece of software, somehow cram a clock in there. Maybe you've got to fix something that you broke, off, you broke recently. Then someone says, oh, a lot of people want to stay close to the Eiffel Tower, so let's cram in a hotel. Let's add some more time zones because we have visitors from all over the world. And then one day, uh, we'll just repurpose the whole thing. We want to do something else with it. We don't want to invest money to change it, so we'll just somehow cram it in there and just uh, use it the way it is. And oftentimes, this is what happens, right? So, <laughs> and you can imagine what the code looks like when you work on, a, an, on an application that's built that way. So we say there has to be a better way. We have to be agile. We have to be ready for these changing requirements. And we say, well, it's the architecture stupid. You're just doing it wrong. Let's imagine you have a monolith, you built an application, one big chunk, 
you try and structure it well, and over the years, more and more features creep in. You build more and build more, like with the Eiffel Tower ex example. And then one day, you have no idea what's going on, and it's just a big ball of mud. So we say, well, monoliths are bad. Let's not do that. Let's separate it. That's uh, service-oriented architecture. It was a thing in the 2010s around. And we say, well, you separate the application, you have separate services, and let's coordinate these services using a service bus in the middle. You say, you do that? Okay, great. Again, you features add, you build more and more stuff. And then one day, again, it's a mess. You don't know what's going on, features creeped in. And so we say, no, 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 no. So this serv so our stuff was not great. The service bus is complicated, too much logic in there. Let's use microservices. Let's get rid of the service bus. Let's have our, ser let's have our services independently, and uh, let's let them talk to each other. And of course, it didn't really solve our problem. It's still complicated. It's still difficult to maintain. So then you say, oh, right, we should make it even smaller, even smaller deployment units. We have the cloud. Let's go all in on the cloud. So let's go serverless. Let's have small lambdas. So let's, all, let's go all serverless. Let's just use these uh, backends as a service and just somehow make it work. And you can, you can make it work. It's, it's fine. But it's, inc it's even more difficult to maintain. And I'm not saying that serverless is bad, please. But it's just probably not going to make things easier if you're not doing it for the right reasons. So we keep doing this, life of a software engineer. You think you're starting something new, clean slate, solid foundations. This time, I'll do it right. And then a few years in, <laughs> you've built another monstrosity. It, you never really rethought it. You just added and added and added. And you think, oh, geez, I've done it again. And we do this often. We, we rethink something, and we end up in the same place. Let's look at configuration files, for instance. Long ago, 80s and 90s, there were any files, simple configuration files with lots of limitations, but yeah, they were there. Then we came up with XML. We thought that it was not enough, so we built XML. We can now structure whatever we want. We added namespaces, highly flexible. We have schemas to validate everything. Heck, you can write, you can use XSLT, and you can write a whole application in XSLT if you want to. Well, you can only you can write it, but you won't be able to read it. But it works. So we said, no, XML, too messy. There's too much to write. There's too much, too much structure. Not enough data. Let's use JSON. Let's strip all the tags. Just have brackets. Keep it simple. Said, okay, good, that's great. We can use it in the browser. We can parse the same thing. That's great. Then we said, no, JSON is not great. You can't have comments, and it's messy to add in a text editor. So let's use, let's use YAML, okay? Let's strip all the uh, brackets. Just have indentation. Let's use that. Much easier to edit. Until one day you add a space at, uh, by accident, and your whole deployment breaks down. So we said, no, let's use YAML is bad. There are whole websites dedicated to uh, YAML being bad. So let's use TOML, much better. And if you look at TOML, well, it looks like an ini file. Point taken, they're acknowledging that, and they're saying, well, it's kind of based on that. But still, we went full circle, and we didn't really change that much. And along the way, we had to write parsers, we had to write serializers, tooling, everything. And we didn't really add any value along the way. Another thing, single page applications. In the early 2000s, JavaScript started, started being more and more important. Before that, web, websites were just static. And jQuery came along, a very useful library to just make JavaScript more accessible. And then early 2010s, 2000, I think around 2012, 13, so single-page application framework started to skyrocket. So uh, Angular, React, and all the others 
started getting more popular, and they're great. I mean, don't get me wrong, we use them all the time. But of course, there were trade-offs. We built more, we shifted logic from the back end to the client, and a lot of things got more difficult. For instance, uh, you, uh, search engine op engines have difficulties parsing these uh, websites. So we add more logic to make that work. So we add server-side rendering and uh, lots of uh, overhead just to achieve something that we had before that. So now if you read about it, more and more people are saying, well, maybe the single page application was not that great an idea. Maybe we should go back to a multi-page solution. We'll see in the next years where that will lead us. So let's it's 2020, let's just assume we're building a to-do list for your mates. And you, so we'll start off with the back end. We'll use Ktor with Kotlin, it's great. Then we'll use nothing too fancy, Postgres on the, uh, as a database. We'll build everything with Gradle. We'll have an Angular front end with NGRX to manage the state in the front end. We deploy that with an Nginx. We use Docker to container rise everything. We use Jenkins to build the deployment pipeline, and uh, somebody in a meeting somewhere said, well, well, we should have events, so we think, okay, great, let's use Kafka for event processing. Somebody mentioned search, so you bring up an Elasticsearch stack. Uh, by now, you have about 42 different uh, containers, so you want to deploy them using Kubernetes. You don't want to set up a whole Kubernetes cluster yourself. That would be mad. So let's go to AWS and deploy it there. Now that we're at, in AWS, let's deploy everything and have our um, infrastructure as code using CDK. And while we're at it, rewrite everything so we can use code deploy instead of Jenkins. Store every th pictures in S3. And by now, you have some weird uh, performance issue, so you introduce Redis for caching. I mean, this, this works, right? These are all mature technologies that technically a few people can manage. It's hard, but you can do it. Those are all very mature technologies. Maybe it's an overkill for a simple to-do list, but you can do that. Now you're working on that application, your team grows, and one day Heather comes along. She was just at a conference and says, well, I was there and this was a really, really cool uh, person giving a talk about Svelte. So we should rewrite the whole thing using Svelte because it's more efficient. And you just say, okay, yeah, why not? Then Dave comes and says, well, we should use Go, because Go is awesome. Google uses Go, so we should use Go as well. And you just say, yeah, okay, you can, we have this small feature, you can write it in Go if you want to. Meanwhile, you're wondering, where the hell is actually my business logic in all this? <laughs> and then Jeff comes along, and Jeff says, well, we could extract the business logic using smart contracts and blockchain. That's when you start to lose it. You say, no, no, please. Please, no more complexity. This is already way too complex. You're reading through the code base, and this happens. You're wondering, who the hell wrote this? Who? Who was it? You click annotate, and you realize, oh, geez, it was me two years ago. <laughs> How could I forget? And then you build this. It works. But every small change feels like a huge effort. You've got to change so many things all over the place. You can get it done, but you're so slow. And you're, the goal was to have an agile software. Then one day, you've got to update your dependencies. So you go through them, and you realize that you built your entire business case on one library that some guy in Nebraska has been <laughs> thanklessly maintaining for since 2003. And he's... He's gone off in the woods. He's just he he doesn't want to do it anymore. So now you got to take over that piece of software and maintain it yourself. And you just think, oh geez, why am I doing this? And we haven't even sp spoken about the development process. 
So what are we going to do about that? I mean, it's just an endless cycle. So one thing is, don't be naive. Just don't run for everything you just see or read. On the other hand, don't be grumpy either. This is what I'm saying. I'm by no means ranting or anything. So just, you got to be smart about what to use and when to use it. So what are reasons to choose some technology or language or whatever? So one thing is you might say, yeah, well, it solves the problem I have. Okay, maybe. But are you using what you already have to its fullest potential? Maybe not. A good example of that is uh, modern databases. They have lots of features that you perhaps don't, don't even know about. Let's say you want to do some number crunching. Maybe you can just use a simple SQL query to read some aggregate functions and you're fine. You don't need a whole data analysis cluster. And is X built for you what you're planning on using it for? The example I brought earlier with Apache Kafka, maybe if you just want to do some event processing, maybe you don't need a full-blown event processing cluster. Maybe just a simple pops up uh, messaging solution would be enough. Heck, maybe an in-memory thing would be enough. And have you actually tried the technology or did you just read about it? Often you, just see, you, you read something and say, oh, that's great. Let's just go in full, full steam. And what's the cost of integrating it? Maybe it's really good, but integrating it is difficult and adds even more complexity. Is it supported? Is there an active community? Is there a release, is there a release cycle that's frequent? Are there forks? What about the tooling, licensing? Lots of things you've got to ask yourself before just jumping in. Another thing you hear is, well, it will speed up my development, somebody said. Well, can you actually measure that? This is I mean, really difficult. If you think of medical trials in IT, that's what we perhaps should do, but you would need, let's say, 10 teams working on the same project with different uh, technologies and see who is the fastest who, or who does it best. But, I mean, it's not something we can do. But still, try and at least measure it. Maybe in some area, see if it works or not. Or that maybe, it's, maybe it is faster, but integrating it makes it slower in other areas. So you got a, there's a trade-off. Another thing you often hear is, well, big player uses X. Like, let's say, well, Google uses that, or Twitter uses it. First of all, why, you could ask yourself, why are they using it? And do we even have the same problems? Maybe you don't have to manage 10,000 clusters. Maybe if you just have one container, you don't need that much. And do you know what the effort it was or is for them to integrate it? Maybe they have a huge team just managing that. And if you're alone by yourself, you just can't uh, handle that. And don't fall for marketing. Sometimes you see lots of logos all over the place, and you say, yeah, this, 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 and this company uses it, but for what? You don't know that. You don't know what they're using it for. And if a company does a pro product, are they using it themselves? Sometimes not. Then you hear, well, we don't want legacy code. Right? We don't want to be stuck with the old, old code. Well, what does legacy code even mean? Like Michael Fellis, who wrote the book on how to work with legacy code, just says, well, simply, it's code without tests. I like the description that Dylan Beat gave in one of his talks, and he says, well, code that is too scary to update and yet too profitable to delete. And that is often the case. So what are things you can prevent that? Well, you can, have, you can automate things to make it easier to handle. You can have tests. You can deploy frequently so you're more confident. And these are all things that are completely technology agnostic. It doesn't matter that you're, you, if you're using Ruby, Python, whatever framework. It doesn't matter. You can do this with anything. And besides, legacy code as a negative is really weird because normally a legacy is something great. Right? You leave your legacy. Except in software engineering, it's something bad. It also shows that we're terrible at naming things. So another thing you hear is, well, we need to learn. Yeah, that's true. You need to learn. 
But are you open about the fact that you want to learn? Or are you just going all in and you just say, yeah, well, I just want to learn this, and you're not telling anybody? Is there room for failure? Right? Can you just say, okay, maybe it was not such a good idea, let's roll back and do something else. And hopefully you work in a company that acknowledges that. Luckily I do, so we have time given for, by the company to learn things and, and work on them. We don't have to go all in in the products if we don't know about them. And so we've got to find the right moment. It's like buying a laptop, right? You can wait every year. A better one is coming, a better one is coming. At some point, you've got you to gotta decide when to use something. So there's this Gartner hype cycle, if you've heard of it. So if it, when a technology rises, at the beginning, there's like a peak of expected, uh, of, uh, peak of inflated expectation. So we want too much of it. And then we start to learn that it's not that. Then we drop all the way down through the thrust of the, thrust of the delusionment. And then only we start to learn what it's about. So in the early stages, that is when you want to just try and learn what the thing is about. Then you want to understand, adapt, and then towards the end you want to master the technology. So it's probably now, if you talk about serverless, it's probably peak hype, right? We still don't quite know what it's, uh, where it is, and blockchain is somewhere down in the trough because there was so much hope and so far, it hasn't really caught on, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It just doesn't mean it just means we don't really yet know how and where to really use it. Another thing is the adoption life cycle. So, when technology gets adopted, first we have the innovators, early adopters, and then it's like a, a gap. Often, something doesn't get past that. Then, if it gets past that, you get the pragmatists, conservatives, and skeptics that then jump onto it. The skeptics are the ones that really, they don't want to, but they have to at some point. Those are the people that will probably by now still buy a flip phone, if you could. So again, in the early stages, you want to try out new stuff. Maybe a Hello World project, some side project, you want to try out something. Then maybe something internal, internal application, you can try out something. Something short-lived. Great if you have something like that. You can try out something, you know, in half a year's time, you can just throw it away. And then only later, you probably want to use things in long-lasting, consumer-facing solutions. And sometimes, maybe you don't want to use anything, something at all. Maybe it's fine the way it is, you don't need to change it. Just let it run, keep it going, it's fine. Somewhere down there, there's probably a graveyard of JavaScript frameworks that died <laughs> in the early 2010s. And remember, somebody pays you to do this, so be responsible. You can't do it all. You can't just try out everything. So invest in T-shaped skills, right? Do a lot of things uh, good enough and a few things very well. So now we talked about a lot of things, and. Is technology really the major issue in software engineering? Probably not. I think not. Right? Software engineering is hard, and the main challenges are completely technology or language agnostic. What is required? How do you slice something? It's more than just looking for nouns and putting an API around it. And that, that's true no matter how you call it. If you call it a service, a microservice, a lambda, a class, whatever you want to call it, an aggregate, it's difficult to find the right boundaries. And for that, you need to understand the business, its markets, and customers. I can't stress that out enough. If you learn something tonight, please let it be this. It just, there's no way around it. There's no shortcut for this. And boundaries can change with changing requirements. And be aware when the software model, because we're building a model, collides with the actual business. You can feel that usually in your code when something, oh, every change is, is difficult. And how the late uh, Gerald Weinberg once described it, no matter how it looks at first, it's always a people problem. 
So keep it simple, be humble. If a text file with a few lines of PHP and JavaScript is enough, why not, right? You don't have to go all in, full blown. But be aware of limitations, not that something like in the UK happens where you lose uh, tens of thousands of COVID cases because you're using Excel. So remember, software engineering is hard and uh, never stop learning, including me. Yeah, so thank you, everybody. Uh, if you liked what you heard and you want to know, learn more about uh, the company I work for, so you can register here. If you have trouble scanning the QR code, it's uh, ergon.ch slash de slash meet dash ergon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, do we, um, first, reminder for those at home, uh, you can ask your questions uh, in Slido, link in the description below. Meanwhile, do we have any questions in the room? Hi. Hi. So, first of all, I would like to thank you for your talk. It was interesting and entertaining. And I have two questions. First, I would like to ask what Aragon does. So, like, I don't know, do you develop, like, some kind of soft, like, one product, or are you a software agency? Just to, like, connect the talk to that. And then the second question is, what do you think is the most, like, hype-driven area in software engineering? Sir, I didn't quite understand what? the last question. What is what do you think is the most currently hype driven area in software engineering? Okay. Like I don't know, iOS so, engineering, Node.js, or whatever. So uh, first about the company quickly. So luckily I prepared this. <laughs> so we do everything from the beginning to the end. So we do we work out concepts for the customer and we develop the solution. We, uh, we have some products that we also use ourselves and also recommend to customers, and we also do maintenance work, so the whole, whole solution. And we do custom-built software, so we don't use, uh, we don't integrate with, integrate with say, a, a SAP or something. We don't, we're not an SAP integrator or something like that, so we build custom-built software for... A lot of projects from scratch. Yes, yeah. Sometimes we, uh, it, well, it depends, but... Oftentimes, yes, and we build software from scratch, and we maintain it for years. Usually, our product projects are really long-lasting. Uh, mostly, it's... Uh, I was joking about logos, so here are some logos. <laughs> uh, mostly, it's rather internal stuff, so like core business applications. Uh, but we have some things that are consumer-facing, like uh, the Viac plot platform, for um, like uh, uh, pensions and stuff like that, yeah. So that maybe you've heard of this, but mostly it's stuff that you don't really see as a day-to-day -day person. And about hyped uh, subjects at the moment, well, it's 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 very broad, right? So for probably the whole cloud area is because they're really pushing hard and they're bringing a lot of features, a lot of features, and sometimes when you look at them, you realize, well, it's not so mature. Like, so it, it, a lot of promises, a lot of things are really good. I mean, you very helpful, probably wouldn't, if you can deploy something in the cloud nowadays, you do, because it's just easier and, but there are a lot of things in that area. Like I said, serverless, terrible name, Another example where we just terrible naming, but uh, we still don't know what really how to use it, and a lot of arguments. Where is it really? Is it cheaper or is it more expensive? Stuff like that. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's so broad everything, but I would probably say in that area, at least in the fields that I'm working in, I see it there. Thank you. The next question comes from the internet and is presented by our signal angel. 
So the question from the internet is, do you think the challenges are also changing since uh, relatively to architecture, for example, software development is extremely new? Yeah, that's probably a reason. It's relatively new. But what, what's weird is, and uh, if you know Kevin Henney, he gives a lot of talks where he looks at the history of software engineering. And a lot of, oftentimes, these are all, those are all not new problems. The problems we're facing now are the people in the 70s had, the sim, had, had similar, similar problems. Like, how do I structure my code? How do I test my code? All these things. Those are not new problems. And a lot of times there have been solutions for them, but we just lost them in time. Often also because we just keep reinventing stuff, reinventing stuff, and we just maybe improve something in one area, and then while we improve something there, it gets worse in the others. So we just, but because it's so moving so fast, I, pr I personally don't see the end, any, any end in that. Maybe it we'll just, it just gets more and more complex, and hopefully we can just stay ahead of it and just keep it going. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that thought. Um, then, uh, do we have any more questions in the room or on the internet? Well, if that is not the case, um, then I want to thank you, Ranil, for joining us at FISCON and giving this very interesting talk. Thank you very much. And sticking with us even through the tough times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.